seven, a little over 40 years. And I want to tell you about a city in Greece called Salonika, or as the locals pronounce it, Thessaloniki. It's a very beautiful northern seaport in Greece. Both of my parents are from there. My older sister and older brother were born there as well. I believe this picture was taken shortly before my parents left Greece. Coming to America was the dream of millions. The Greek line passenger ship Nea Elas was the ship of dreams to thousands fleeing Nazi Germany. It was used by Greeks and other Europeans in search of freedom and a new life in America. My parents, four-year-old sister, and less than a year old brother left Greece on May 22, 1951. They arrived in New York on June 6, about two weeks later. Their trip by train then took them to Minneapolis two days later. After a five to six month stay there, they moved to Atlanta arriving on November 29th, 1951. The following June, I was born. My younger sister followed five years later. This slide shows um, um, uh, my family tree, um, my father, mother. Uh, this is me down here, younger sister, older brother, older sister my mother siblings, my father siblings, and I've included my father's cousin here and her husband, Heinz Cuno, because I'll be talking about them. My parents spoke very little about what happened to them during the Holocaust with their children. I would imagine that the horrors of what they saw and experienced was not something one might discuss with young children. Let me begin with a little history first. There are three regional subcultures of Judaism, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, and Mizrahi Jews. These three groups originated from different areas of the globe, as you can see here on this map. The three groups differ by their interpretations of Jewish law. <laughs> Pronunci is that funny? <laughs> um, they differ by interpretations of Jewish law, pronunciation of some Hebrew vowels and consonants, some prayer melodies, holiday customs, and yes, differing traditional foods, to name a few. The Jews of Greece, from which I am descended are Sephardic and originated in Spain. The international language of the Ashkenazic Jews is the Yiddish language, which is based on German and Hebrew. The international language of the Sephardic Jews is Ladino, based on Spanish and Hebrew. You remember as a child, Sometimes your parents would want to say something that they didn't want their children to hear. Well, my parents spoke primarily Ladino at home, with some Greek thrown in, and a little French, and some Turkish, so mostly I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> Since my cultural upbringing was influenced by the Sephardic Jews of Spain, let me tell you a little about their history. Spanish Jews once constituted one of the largest and most prosperous Jewish communities in the world. Spain was the unquestioned leader of world Jewry. The Jews in Spain were citizens of the kingdoms in which they resided, both as regards to their customs and their language. They owned real estate, cultivated their lands, held public offices, and became wealthy while their knowledge and abilities won them respect and influence. In addition to these fields, money lending also brought them wealth and influence. 
clergymen, noblemen, and farmers all needed money. But in the eyes of the church, lending money was heresy. Therefore, only Jews were moneylenders. Money was loaned at 20 to 25 percent interest, quite a high rate, but a necessary rate, so that the Jews would be able to pay the high taxes imposed upon them by the king. This prosperity roused the jealousy of the people and the hatred of the clergy. The king regarded the Jews as his property and used them to his benefit. Around the year 1300, there were about 120 Jewish communities in Catholic Spain, numbering around 500,000 Jews. Over time, jealousy turned to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism turned to revolt. In 1391, a revolt broke out in Seville. It was ordered that the Jews be baptized or killed. 4,000 Jews were put to death. The rest submitted to baptism as their only means of escaping death. At this time, Seville was said to have contained 7,000 Jewish families. Two out of three of the large synagogues in the city were transformed to churches. Jews were robbed and slain. This continued in Cordoba, Jaén, Toledo, Valencia, Palma, Mallorca, Barcelona, and Lerida, to name a few. Corpses lay in heaps in the streets, in houses, and in the wrecked synagogues. The year 1391 forms a turning point in the history of the Spanish Jews. The persecution was the immediate forerunner of the Inquisition, introduced as a means of converting the Jews. It is estimated that more than 200,000 Jews were converted as their only means of escaping death. March 31, 1492. The Alhambra Decree, also known as the Edict of Expulsion, was issued by then King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, ordering the expulsion of the Jews in Spain by July 31st, just four months later. Their primary purpose, to eliminate Jewish influence on Spain's already converted population and ensure they did not revert to Judaism. The short time span forced the Jews to liquidate their homes and businesses at absurdly low prices. Between 40,000 and 100,000 Jews were expelled. Tens of thousands died trying to reach safety. In some cases, Spanish ship captains charged Jewish passengers exorbitant sums of money, then dumped them in the middle of the ocean. With rumors that fleeing Jews had swallowed gold and diamonds, many Jews were knifed to death in search of treasures in their stomachs. The Spanish Jews, who were fortunate enough to escape with their lives, were known as Sephardim, Sephardim being the Hebrew name for Spain. These are the Sephardic Jews that I mentioned earlier, my ancestors. The most significant settlement of Jews in Thessaloniki, 15 to 20,000, occurred in 1492 when they left persecution in Spain during the Spanish Inquisition. Others came after being exiled from Sicily, Portugal, and North Africa. These Sephardic Jews were the most dominant in the city and turned it into a first-rate commercial center. They excelled in the field of textiles, worked in the mines, and founded the first printing house in the year 1520. They were rabbis, physicians, philosophers, poets, and lawyers. The fame of Thessaloniki spread all across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and was soon given the honorary title of Mother of Israel. Pretty extraordinary for a place 
you probably never heard of before. Except there is one person here whose family is from Thessaloniki. <laughs> Looking at this side, at this slide, you can see the highlighted area indicating the synagogues that were built uh, after the expulsion from Spain in 1492. In just 75 years, 19 synagogues were built. By 1891, there were more than 30 synagogues in Thessaloniki. The Jews were the dominant labor force in the city, and the streets were deserted on the Sabbath. By 1900, the Jews numbered around 80,000, almost half the population of 173,000. In 1917, a fire accidentally started in the kitchen of a refugee house. With overcrowded conditions, narrow streets, old building materials, oil, and help from the wind, the Great Fire of Salonika, as it was called, destroyed two-thirds of the city, burning 9,500 houses and leaving more than 70,000 people homeless. In April of that year, my father was born. Almost all of the synagogues were lost. Jews began leaving the city. In the 1920s, anti-Semitism arose again. People were forbidden to work on Sunday, which hindered Jewish businesses. Jews were typecast as communists plotting against the state. There were restrictions on the number of Jews permitted to attend the universities. The National Union of Greece, an anti-Semitic group, was established. In 1922, my mother was born. June 29, 1931, arsons burned a Jewish neighborhood. Scores of Jews were injured in the pogrom. A handful were killed. More Jews left the city. They moved to the US, France, Italy, Egypt, and Palestine. Still in 1940, the Jewish community numbered more than 50,000. September 1939, World War II begins with the invasion of Poland. On October 28, 1940, Italy invaded Greece. Refusing to yield to then dictator Mussolini, the Greek army, with the help of the British Royal Air Force, repelled 70,000 Italian soldiers in a matter of days. By November 10th, the Italian army was in full retreat. A month later, the Greek army had pushed the Italian forces out of the southern third of Albania and vowed to march all the way to Rome. Mussolini's failure angered Hitler as he saw it his task to rescue the Italians. Some Jews fought against the Nazis in the Greek army. My only surviving uncle, Nathan Masarano, was one of them. While serving in the Greek army that pushed the Italian forces out, he spoke Italian fluently. Undercover, he provided secrets about the Italians to the Greeks. He was caught and sentenced to death. Before his sentence was carried out, an Italian officer asked him why he had betrayed their trust and divulged their secrets. His response, what did they expect him to tell his own country when the war was over? His response found favor with the Italian officer and his life was spared. He returned to Castoria, a city in northern Greece, and stayed there for some time as the area was under Italian occupation. The Germans eventually took it over in September 1943. In March of 1944, he was arrested there by the Nazis. 
The following month, he was transported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, then to the Flossenburg camp in Germany, and finally to Camp Litmeritz in Czechoslovakia. A little over a year after his arrest, May 9th, 1945, the camp was liberated. Prisoner number 182065, a thin and frail man of about 33 years of age, stepped out of the camp and walked home to Greece. It was a long walk. It's just short of a thousand miles. About 4,500 prisoners perished at Camp Leitmeritz. It's a wonder that he survived it all. His sister Ida and brothers Albert, Joseph, and Meyer, my aunts and uncles, were not as fortunate. Castoria, where my uncle was arrested, had a Jewish population estimated at 900 back in 1940. Only 35 survived. My uncle went back home to Thessaloniki and married. He and his wife, Stedina, had three daughters, Ninetta, Ida, and Mary, my only first cousins. April 6, 1941, the Nazis invaded Greece. Three days later, April 9th, the city of Thessaloniki was invaded and occupied by the Nazis. Within days, anti-Jewish measures were implemented, slowly at first, then more and more aggressively. It was very bad. Within two days, the Jewish daily newspapers were forced to close down. Their printing presses were confiscated. Jews were not permitted to go into coffee houses, restaurants, or theaters. Their homes were taken over. The Jewish hospital was taken over. Members of the Jewish Community Council were imprisoned. Their offices were looted. Jewish archives and Jewish libraries were destroyed. Some Jews escaped from German-occupied Greece by moving to the Italian-occupied zones before the Germans took them over. My dad was one of them. He left his home in Thessaloniki and traveled to Athens, or the area around Athens that was still in the Italian-occupied zone. He spoke French fluently, which he took advantage of to avoid being targeted as a Jew and being captured. My father owned a paper factory in Thessaloniki with two partners. One was Jewish, the other was not. They put the name of the business into the non-Jewish partner's name in an attempt to save it. One day my father's Jewish partner came in to report the German army coming into the city. He told my father that they needed to go to the Jewish Community Center to make plans for their arrival. My father was skeptical of the idea and didn't go. His partner went. As it turned out, after entering the front door of the Community Center, my father's partner was arrested by the Germans and put in a truck waiting in the back door. A little over a year later, it got worse. On Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, July 11th, 1942, all male Jews between the ages of 18 and 45 were ordered to the town square to be registered. Around nine to 10,000 showed up to stand outdoors in the heat and perform humiliating physical exercises. Those who arrived late or couldn't endure and passed out were savagely beaten. Shortly after, about 7,000 were sent to forced labor, building roads and barricades for the Germans. 
Working in primitive conditions, many died of exhaustion and disease from being treated badly. The Germans demanded an enormous ransom to release the forced laborers, three and a half billion drachmas. As the community of Thessaloniki could only raise two and a half billion drachmas, the Germans demanded the abandonment of the Jewish cemetery, claiming its size and location had long hampered urban growth. A couple of months later, in December, under the pretext of urban planning, the Germans started destroying the Jewish cemetery parts of which dated back to the 15th century when the Jews were expelled from Spain and used the tombstones as building material. Survivors returning after the war found the broken tombstones had been used for walkways, to pave the city streets, rebuild Greek churches, and even to build pools for the German army. This is a pool here. In February 1943, conditions worsened. The Germans issued orders requiring all Jews ages five years and older to wear a yellow star on their clothing to identify themselves as Jews. All Jews were required to register and issued special identity cards. They were not allowed to buy or sell property of any kind and banned from using public transportation. Ghettos were established in the city and the Jews were forced to move into these designated areas by the Germans. 6,000 families were ordered to leave their homes on short notice, leaving only with what they could carry. In the ghetto areas, conditions were so cramped, as many as six families had to share a single home. Initially, they were allowed to leave the ghetto to go to work. Soon after, they were forbidden to leave at all, under threat of being shot. About 500 Jews avoided deportation by escaping to nearby mountains, joining partisan units that fought the Germans. My mother, Matilda, was one of them. One day, two young sisters, Ida and Matilda, my mother, were permitted to leave the ghetto for the pharmacy to bring back needed medicine for the family. It was then that my mother, about 17 or 18 years old, told her sister she was going to run away and not return to the ghetto. And that's what she did. Her sister, Ida, did return to the ghetto. My mom never saw her family again. She escaped into the mountains in northern Greece and joined the partisans in the resistance movement. She served as a nurse while she was with the partisans. She would come back into the city under the bogus name of Katarina to gain and divulge information for the Greeks. The only reason I'm standing here today is because my mother took that chance. Some Jews could not avoid deportation and were placed in the ghetto and then transferred to the death camps. One of them was my cousin Heinz Cuno that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation and his family. Taken from their large upper middle class home and given two hours to gather their belongings, Heinz, 15 years old, his 17-year-old sister Erica and their parents, Salvatore and Hella, were relocated in a coffee house in the ghetto with a leaky roof and nowhere to sleep for two days. 
At 2 a.m. on the second day of their detainment, Hines and his family were ordered to the town square where they waited for two hours. They were not alone. They waited along with 2,800 other Jews from the ghetto. On Saturday, March 14, 1943, the Jewish Sabbath, 451 years to the month that the Jews were ordered out of Spain, all 2,800 Jews in the Baron Hirsch ghetto in Thessaloniki were selected for deportation. They were marched to the rail yard. The Jews of Thessaloniki had the dubious distinction of being the first community destined for annihilation right after the crushing military defeat Hitler suffered at Stalingrad. The Germans forced the Jews to purchase tickets for their trip to death. The first transport of Jews from Thessaloniki supposedly was destined for Krakow, Poland. It was required that all monies be converted to Polish zloty. A small allowance of personal belongings was permitted to be taken and each head of family received a check for 600 Polish zloty. Under penalty of severe punishment, the Jews were required to deposit all of their valuables at the ghetto offices before they left. The Germans spread rumors that their properties would be returned after the war. The reality was the zloty they received was counterfeit. The checks they received were counterfeit. Their property would not be returned. Where they were going, there was no need for money. The Jews were packed in animal cars and readied for their perilous journey. More than 70 people were packed in a single car with a barrel of water and a barrel for human waste. The first transport from Thessaloniki with my cousin, Heinz Cunio and his family trudge slowly toward its destination. Six days with nowhere to sit, many died along the way. At times, the Germans would not allow the removal of any dead bodies from the cars, declaring that the same number of Jews who entered the cars must be unloaded on arrival. At other times, when the train stopped, the bodies were left alongside the tracks. The Greek Jews were located the farthest from the death camps, resulting in very long journeys that claimed many lives even before their arrival. Communication was hindered as they did not know the German, Yiddish, or Polish language. They were not used to the extreme bitter cold climate of the region, so foreign in Mediterranean countries. This went on for five months, transport after transport. In total, there were 19 transports in those five months between March 1943 and August 1943. <clears throat> Some 50,000 Jews were taken away from Thessaloniki. Among them, my aunts, uncles, and grandparents. Less than 4% of the Jews of Thessaloniki survived. Six days after being loaded on the train and eight days after being taken from their home, Heinz and his family arrived at the camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau. As the train cars were being unloaded, 
The Germans yelled out their orders, but the Greeks didn't understand them. The Greeks didn't understand the German language, and the Germans didn't understand the Greek language. My cousin, Heinz, and his family, able to speak German fluently, stepped forward to translate. Families were randomly separated and often didn't see one another again. Those that appeared healthy enough to work were sent to forced labor. Heinz and his father were separated from his mother and sister. It was months later that he learned they were still alive. After being arranged in groups, questioned regarding age, physical ability, and health, the following message was barked out by one of the German SS officers. You have arrived at a German concentration camp and not at a sanitarium to restore your health. This entire concentration camp has only one exit. The tall black chimney over there and the dense black smoke coming out. All of you will pass through there. Under the premise of getting cleaned up, having a meal, and being assigned to work, people were led to their death in makeshift showers that were used solely for the purpose of poisoning them. They were then carried to the crematorium where their bodies were burned. When the bodies piled up too quickly and couldn't be burned fast enough, large pits were dug where the bodies were dumped. By September 1943, Italy had surrendered and Germany took over all of the Italian occupied zones and Hitler's finer, final solution was underway. Still treated poorly, Heinz and his family were the only Greek Jewish family from Thessaloniki that would survive the camps intact, all returning to Greece after the liberation. Heinz's father was a photographer and asked one of the soldiers for his camera on the day the camp was liberated. He took this picture of Heinz. After being liberated and upon return to their home, they found it to be occupied by immigrants. After contacting local authorities, they were able to get back one room in their large home. Over the course of the next year or two, only by way of bribing the immigrants who had taken up residence, they were able to get their entire home back. Heinz Cuno, my second cousin, is in his 90s and still lives in Thessaloniki with his family. Booby, as we call him, devoted his life after the war to searching for the names of the more than 45,000 Jews from Thessaloniki that were murdered at the hands of the Nazis during the war. Not an easy task no computer. He did it by hand. A couple of months ago, March 17th, 2,000 people held a silent march in Thessaloniki. This picture is from that march showing my cousin, Heinz, receiving a plaque commemorating the departure of the first train that took him, his family, and members of the Jewish community to the Auschwitz death camp on March 15th, 1943. In October of 1944, Greece was liberated. Growing up in Atlanta, some of my parents' friends were those from Thessaloniki. They had tattooed numbers on their arms. I was too young to understand what that meant. 
At age 15, my parents sent my older sister and me to Greece. We spent the entire summer there. It was an experience I will never forget. It was then, for the first time, that I met my family. That's, oops. That's me, my older sister, and my three cousins. <laughs> A few years ago, in December 2015, I was fortunate enough to visit Thessaloniki again with my wife, Sylvia. It wasn't until then, after speaking with my cousins, that I had come to learn how guilty my mother had felt for leaving her family that day for the pharmacy. She carried that guilt her whole life. She risked her life to run away and escaped being murdered and felt guilty about it. Thessaloniki is a beautiful city, once a hub of Jewish civilization. Today, Thessaloniki's Jews number fewer than a thousand. There are a few synagogues. I visited the synagogue that my parents were likely married in. On the wall is a plate with some of my relatives' names. This one bears the name of my great uncle, Solomon Cohen. In the city square where the men were ordered to report on that hot sunny day is a memorial. There's a marble plaque at the old railway station as a tribute to those that left there on their last trip. I stood on the tracks that took my family away. In the Jewish Museum is a room surrounded by brass plaques, floor to ceiling, of the majority of the names of the tens of thousands of Jews and year they were murdered, collected by my cousin Booby. There is also a picture of a group of partisans in the museum, among them my mother. That's her right there. Just a few years ago, in 2014, the government of Spain passed a law allowing dual citizenship to Jewish descendants in order to, quote, compensate for shameful events in the country's past. Thus, Sephardic Jews who are descendants of those Jews expelled from Spain due to the Alhambra decree can become Spaniards without leaving home or giving up their present nationality. These words, written by Doug Kotler, put things into perspective for me. I'm standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. Today my life is full of choice because a young man raised his voice, because a young girl took a chance. I am freedom's choice inheritance. Years ago they crossed the sea. They made a life that's come to me. I'm standing on the shoulders of the ones who came before me. Thank you for your time and attention. If there are any questions, I'd be uh, happy to attempt to answer them <laughs> if I can. How long have you been working on the research um, to gather this story? Um, I guess uh, 
off and on for years, but, but uh, um, more concentrated, I guess, in the last two or three. How did your parents get permission to leave? To leave Greece? Well, it was after the war. So uh, a lot of people left. Um, I don't know the uh, <coughs> uh, what was required to leave, um, and I'm not sure exactly. They had pretty much nothing. Um, <coughs> I still have the uh, um, their their ticket passage ticket from uh, the ship they came in on. Um, uh, it was less than a thousand dollars for the four of them, and it took like two weeks. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know what the requirements were then to leave the country. Thank you. There were two questions. When your mom was in the prisons, was that a mixed group of Greeks, Jews, or were they all Jews? And then the second question is: In the Italian zone, were the Italians easier than the Nazi-occupied zones? Were the same like? I, was the second question? There were for a while Greece. There, I think you said there was a zone occupied by the Italian troops, and then eventually the Nazis came in. Was it a little easier on the Jews when the Italians were in control? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, under the Italian occupied zones, uh, the Jews were not being deported and arrested. So it was a safe place to take refuge uh, until the Germans took over. And what was your first question? The partisans you may not know, but was it a mixture oh. of Greeks and Jews? Or yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, I don't know if they were all Jews uh, or a mixture of Greek and Jew, uh, Greeks and Jews. I don't know. Any idea how she found out? Any way to find out? How she got, I mean, to go there. How did she know? Was it well known, or how did she know? Yeah, like, I'm running away from the pharmacy. How do I know to uh, find the partisans? I think it was known that, that Greeks were escaping and running to the mountains. Um, and she decided to do it. Uh, I don't know, 17 or 18 years old. I mean, I can't imagine making a decision like that myself. Uh, I don't think I would have had the guts to do that. Uh, but it saved her life. And that's why I'm here. So that was a good thing. <laughs> Eli, was it, is there any restitution to the Jews of, of Greece? Um, <clears throat> any restitution? I remember when I was younger that my father was working on that kind of stuff and sending documents back and forth to somebody, and um, <clears throat> and I remember what what he received in return, and it was a thousand dollars. He he lost a factory and. Not to mention his entire family. <laughs> Eli, um, this is one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard. I, I wonder if you were thinking about writing a book. <laughs> I know you're a scholar. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I haven't really thought about writing a book. Uh, his cousin wrote a book. Yeah, my cousin Hines has, has written book. several books. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that that picture of him on the Day of Liberation. That picture came from his book. Okay. Are you aware of the book by uh, Andy Aldaba, 600 Days in Hiding, of Seth Tamalikin? No, I'm not. Uh, he's a classmate of mine, and he wrote that book about two years ago. Oh, wow. It's called 600 Days in Hiding, because his family was never taken, and they moved from place to place in Thessalonica oh. during the war. What were their names? Uh, I don't know. His English name now is Algava. A L G A V A. Okay. And the book is Six Hundred Days in Hiding. That name doesn't sound familiar to me uh, growing well, up, but okay. Uh, well, it doesn't mean anything. I don't know everybody. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was Louder. How did you come to learn the whole story? How did I come to learn the whole story? Um, did they talk about it growing up? No, my, my parents didn't, didn't talk about it very much at all. Uh, little snippets here and there. Um, <clears throat> I, I, guess, I guess they didn't want to talk about that to their young children. 
but when my, I learned more when my mother went to visit my cousins in Greece, and I was older then, and she was able to talk to them uh, more freely than to her own children and tell them things. Uh, for example, the guilt that she felt for leaving her family. Um, I never knew that. I never knew that she felt guilty her whole life. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine. Um, but uh, I guess over the course of time, talking to my cousins, uh, my family in Greece, uh, my uncle, uh, just picking up pieces here and there is how I have come to learn what I know now. And, and there's plenty that I don't know. Ella and Aaliyah. And, and, and their children. Mm -hmm. and, and they could not have been more proud and more happy of what they're doing. His uncle Hines is almost 92 or something, right. and he still speaks and works at, all the time to children, to educators all throughout the city. And, and they just have made a life for themselves. And, and a rebirth, and then we were walking around the city and came to the photography shop where where their kids were still working today, and um, it was really a, a pleasure. The, the oldest uh, photography store in Thessaloniki. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is just another opportunity to, to emphasize the importance of <coughs> not just survivor stories, but getting to know your own story, getting to know your family's story. Um, everybody's story is unique and different, and it really is up to us at this point, and uh, it's never too early, students, mm -hmm. to start asking these questions, because I run into, even myself, um, realizing how little I, I don't know and, and won't know about my story. With that said, I also want to encourage y'all, even if you aren't a second, third, fourth generation survivor, but are interested in volunteering with us, we are here um, and our door is open. You do not have to have a family connection to adopt a, a story of a survivor who's not with us any longer, or who uh, is not able to, to spread the word um, and through their stories, get to do what, what Eli's doing with his family's story. Eli, how has your experience been going to schools and I mean, what, do you, what do you feel? Is well, it, it's, a, it's been a positive experience for me. Um, I have, uh, I guess, kept silent for so long and, and I hear other stories and, um, and, and go to uh, um, Holocaust remembrance programs and hear other stories. And I just decided it's time for me to speak up. Uh, I have a story to tell. Uh, my family was there right in the middle of it, and uh, I just decided to start speaking up about it. Um, and with that said as well, if you want to learn more about our survivor stories and, and Eli's family as well, our website is vhgc.org, and we have an incredible amount of educational resources ready at your fingertips to all of your teachers or uh, genealogists out there and if um, you ever have anything to add um, our door is also open to, to research um, to answer any questions or to, to hold your hand while you're you know trying to figure out where you come from what your story is and maybe what your voice is in that story so Eli thank you oh I'm sorry I have one more question Eli how did you folks end up in Atlanta um, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, they, they came over in the boat uh, through Ellis Island. Um, I guess they were sponsored, uh, got on a train, went to Minneapolis. Uh, my father was in the paper business in Greece, so he actually got a job with a paper company 
in Minneapolis. They were there for about six months. Um, <clears throat> my mother was at home uh, taking care of the kids, kids my older sister uh, and older brother, and she was watching. Did they speak English? Uh, the kids? No, your parents. Oh, um, my father, much better than my mother. Um, broken, and I think my father went to night school to learn. Um, but uh, the story that uh, my mother has told is that she was uh, at home <coughs> with my older brother and older sister watching TV for the first time in her life um, while my dad was at work, <coughs> and she's watching the news, and, the, and the, they were deciding where to, to settle. Uh, and I think it was between uh, Kansas City and Atlanta. And uh, my mother saw in the news this big flood in Kansas City <laughs> with, with the river overflowed. And uh, you can Google that, I did. Uh, in 1951, there was a massive flood in Kansas City. So when my dad came home, she said, we're not going to Kansas City. <laughs> that, that's how they got to Atlanta. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> More than that, <laughs> uh, and I was born shortly after. <laughs> a broader question: that the Holocaust was obviously a prevailing force against anti-Semitism post World War II. Is there any factor that now shows that the anti-Semitism that currently is persistent in colleges and everywhere else has lost any countermanding effect against what the Holocaust was in favor of? Well, <clears throat> if I understand the, the question correctly, uh, you know, an anti Semitism exists today uh, like it did then. Uh, maybe it's not quite as prevalent and people are not being deported and such. But uh, in Greece, for example, that uh, memorial in the town square. Um, on a regular basis is vandalized um, uh, with spray paint and such. Uh, cemeteries are, are destroyed, uh, but, but it's not just Greece, it's everywhere. I mean, you read it in the news all the time. So, uh, you know, anti-Semitism anti is, is, is out there, um, just like it was. I mean, it, it hadn't gone away. Did, did that answer your question? Uh, well, I was thinking as to what weakened the Holocaust story such that the other gained ascendancy. Well, um, a couple of weeks ago, I, uh, I heard an author at, uh, at our temple, Bethel, uh, a German author, um, who... Uh, some huh? Emmanuel. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> oh, yeah, Emmanuel, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Temple Emmanuel. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> she, her grandfather was uh, in the German army uh, and was an officer and was responsible for um, the murder of many Jews. Um, and and listening to her perspective, and it never occurred to me um, how family of perpetrators feel after the war. I mean, it's not just those survivors and whose families were lost, but what about families of the perpetrators? And um, she never knew her grandfather. Uh, she said that he had been uh, tried and, and, and sentenced to death like 14 years before she was born. Um, but it's very interesting to hear that side of the story and how um, they don't talk about it too much. Uh, the family, they don't want to uh, uh, mar the name of their uh, uh, family members, so they don't discuss it. Uh, and she's, she's uh, um, her family has uh, come down on her for exposing it and talking about it. Um, um, so she, she's dealt with a lot of that. Uh, but, it, but it was interesting to hear that perspective. One thing that she said that was so interesting is 
she was one of the few people that had dealt with her Nazi uh, relative, which was her grandfather, who was high, high ranking and who was hung. Right. And um, she said the people that have not dealt with it, that's who is gaining power in Germany today. She said they're the th third largest, uh, I think the Nationalist Party, and she said that they have not dealt with any of it, so they're therefore anti-Semitic, and it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And she did talk about her own mother, because that was her father, her mother's father, and how her mother became an alcoholic in um, depression, and if it hadn't been for Alexandria's father, you know, he pretty much raised her. But yeah, you don't ever think of the other side of the story and you know, how it affects people. But it is a lack of telling any of these stories that also, I think, permeates. Mm -hmm and perpetuates anti-Semitism to continue. Um, I'll be honest, we've had workshops here. You know, we we educate teachers, we teach teachers how to teach the Holocaust is one of our biggest mission um, points. And we've had teachers sound out the word anti-Semitism at a workshop because they've never seen it. Mm -hmm. So the work we have to do and the, the layers of that, it's forever, you know, it's gonna take a long time.